the Monkey Mind Podcast, your number one platform for athletes and mental health, hosted by Danny Perez and Anthony Florentino. This is episode 52 featuring Scott Kelsey. Scott is a former professional hockey player turned founder and CEO at Sherapy and branch manager at Movement Mortgage in New Jersey. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Daily Dose CBD Inc. Daily Dose CBD Inc. creates full-spectrum CBD products ranging from tinctures, bombs, and dog treats. Research has shown that CBD has successful results in aiding in the following areas. Anti-inflammation, anxiety, PTSD, help with breaking addiction, neuroprotection, epilepsy, arthritis, chronic pain, and sleeping disorders. Daily Dose meets an extremely safe and effective product that we know you will love, enjoy, and benefit from. Daily Dose has given Monkey Mind listeners 15% off all their orders. Head over to DailyDoseCBDInc.com and use promo code MONKEYMIND15 for 15% off your purchases. That's promo code MONKEYMIND15 for 15% off all your orders at DailyDoseCBDInc.com. All right, well, let's get started then. Um, thank you for coming on. Um, really appreciate taking the time to come on and talk with us and tell your story. If you could just introduce yourself and tell everyone who you are and the sport you played and your journey. Yeah, so... Scott Kelsey, um, the, uh, I currently reside in, in Princeton, New Jersey area. I uh, grew up in upstate New York, a uh, small town, Clark Mills, New York, which is situated about five miles uh, outside of Clinton, New York, five miles outside of Utica, New York. So uh, up in that reason, I mentioned both those towns because they're pretty well known for some hockey uh, history um, with Utica currently having the, uh, the Vancouver's franchise there and and Clinton's had a hockey for a hundred years there. So whether it was youth hockey, uh, college hockey, Hamilton College up there, they had the old Eastern Hockey League team, the Clinton Comets. Um, so uh, beginning of the my hockey journey um, started there, probably five or six years old. Good hockey town. My brother was a little bit older. Um, he heard over the announcement uh, at school that there was uh, you could sign up for hockey. Um, wasn't a hockey family. We weren't a hockey family. My dad had played basketball and baseball, but it sounds like something fun to do. And my parents were pretty supportive of it. So played my youth hockey there. Great, great youth organization. Um, uh, played my high school hockey there. Uh, you know, good, good, solid hockey program. Um, Clinton High School um, had good success up there. And then uh, when it came time to go to school and uh, look for colleges, I was looking both for baseball and, and hockey, um, which seemed to be, you know, it, it was, it was, an e it was an easy fit for some schools, but it was a decision in terms of, can I go somewhere to focus on one or should I go somewhere to try to, you know, play two? So the latter kind of took its weight and uh, that's what I focused on in terms of finding a school I could play both. Um, so it drew me out of the Southern, hemisphere, so to speak, and just kept me up in the Northeast. So I ended up between um, looking at some schools in Boston, looking at schools out West, as far as uh, Air Force Academy through a bunch of the SUNYACs through a bunch of the Division Three schools. I ended up staying uh, in my hometown um, or close there and, and, and played at Hamilton College for four years. So, so uh, good, great school, good program, great coaches, good friends. Um, you know, I... Uh, and you guys can stop me like and pause um, whenever, just put your hand up or whatever you think. But oh, yeah, good. I'll, I'll uh, you know, without Borneo in terms of my uh, my goal scoring uh, prowess when I was in, in youth hockey and, you know, me, you know, I, I played forward up until uh, high school hockey where the high school team was good enough that after my sophomore year, the coach had asked me to play defense because they were lacking the defense and, I didn't make it my freshman year. I mean, we had a good enough squad, but long story short, turned into a defenseman in a sophomore year uh, or junior year of uh, high school and, and stuck that out. Um, but uh, later on in the story, you know, in terms of my hockey journey, I ended up playing where I, where I needed to, you know, to keep a roster spot, especially um, when I got into the minor league. So, um, but predominantly uh, college, had a great, good, good, good college career. Uh, looking back at it, probably, should have been a lot better. Um, and I'll put the onus on me for that. But, you know, it got me uh, to where I thought, you know, at the time, uh, my biggest goal was, which it, which probably wasn't the time to play professional hockey. And, you know, that took me um, probably, you know, I graduated in 93 from Hamilton. 
in, uh, you know, just backtracking a little bit to graduation, um, I didn't really have a sense of like urgency to, to get into the working world. Um, I mean, I guess that helps because I had an agent working for me and we had solidified a couple spots to play and it was just always trying to, you know, getting in, got a contract in Europe, got a couple uh, tryouts in the East Coast Hockey League, got a tryout in Utica, they had a Central Hockey League, uh, they had a United Hockey League, I think it was an UHL team, um, just starting that year. Um, so it was always like, as, as people are familiar with sports, you know, always trying to get into like one level above for camp. So um, I turned down the the, the uh, European contract late because of some financial questions on some of the teams over there and ended up actually, again, staying close to home and got invited to go to Utica and play with them. I thought it was great because, you know, local guy, there was a couple of guys, a couple of guys that played at St. Lawrence, a couple of guys that played at Hamilton that were touted as like the local guys staying there. Ended up playing uh, for Marty Howe for about a, a half a uh, quarter of the season, got traded, um, but kind of worked my way uh, from there down to the, you know, that, that first year down the East Coast Hockey League, which is, I thought at the time was a better fit for me. And then that turned into that team folding and going to San Antonio, which kind of was my entree into the Central Hockey League, where I spent the next four and a half years and then took a job up here in Princeton after the 90 eight season in Memphis, you know, probably 400 plus games there and um, worked as a mortgage person, mortgage uh, professional um, about a year into it. Trenton Titans got a team here. I helped fill a spot in camp just to help them out. I knew Mike Cavillan and Bruce Cassidy was coaching them at the time. Um, went to camp and uh, ended up playing about 40 or 50 games somewhere around there over the course of the next three or four years while I was still trying to write loans and, uh, and make my way in the working world. Uh, that that was uh, yeah, that was my hockey stuff. You know, my hockey career. Um, played a lot of games afterwards, um, and continued to play uh, flying around the country, around the world, in different tournaments with friends, uh, with my buddies here in, in Central New York or Central New Jersey. Sorry, um, all around the country. You guys know all these various tournaments that go on, but that stopped. Um, pretty abruptly three just about three years ago so um i don't know how do you guys want me to segue into this some of this yeah. stuff no we'll just uh switch gears and just kind of um you know that's obviously a, an extensive background who you are and that's awesome so uh yeah i think um you played a, you know, quite a number of years of pro and got to extend that career um quite a bit so that's awesome and something a lot of people dream of so um yeah I just want to switch gears and talk about you know the work that you've done um, as a mental health advocate and kind of some of the stuff that you've struggled with um, in, with mental health in general. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go there and I'm so you know glad that you, what you guys are doing and what you put together. And like I had said to you before, Danny, when we met um, and Flo, obviously, hopefully that doesn't run to you guys, but um, it's whatever I can do to help you guys out because it's been near and dear to my heart, not just as you know, as somebody that recognizes that, you know, mental health is still a huge issue and the stigma behind it's just got to be, you know, there's got to be more folks like us that are joining hands and joining forces uh, to, to help out. But I'm also uh, struggling with, with, with anxiety and depression for probably the last 25 years. Um, not admitting it for probably a good portion, the majority of those years. Um, and probably a large portion of those years, not admitting it to myself that it was really issue, a real issue, right? It was, just, you know, back up into, I think it was the 96 season, um, back into when I was playing in Memphis and um, our team doctor at the time and some people that were close to me uh, went to our, our, went to one of the doctors and said, Scott's just not like himself. And I got tested, did a neuropsych battery, all this sort of stuff. And he looked me in the eye afterwards, pretty extensive test. And he said, Scott, I, you know, I don't think it's a, uh, post concussion syndrome. I don't, you know, I, you know, obviously you got your bell rung, stuff like that. He goes, I think you just uh, suffer from anxiety and depression. And I nicely said, Hey, I, no disrespect, but playing hockey for a living, getting paid, you know, to do something that I dreamed of when I was a kid, my, my handicap's gone down from like a 10 to like a four, you know, living in Memphis, bar you know, I don't think I've, yeah. I disagree. And, you know what, he was, that, that guy was right. Um, 
and I realized it a little bit more and more as years progressed, but I just dealt with it in wrong ways, whether it was keeping busy, working harder, whether it was self-medicating, however you want to put that, um, it was just plain ignoring it, you know, um, which, which was, which seemed fine for a while, like, you know, from, uh, 1998 till uh, six years ago, you know, I, I had, you know, had some relationships. I was married six years ago, um, for the first time. Um, but it wasn't hard for me to, to, to do well and kind of mask all the stuff that was going on inside of me with, you know, it wasn't hard because I could pick and choose where I, where I was, who I would be with and stuff like that. Right. So if I was having a bad day at work, Fortunately, in, in our world, in the lending world, um, as a salesperson, you can kind of write your own hours and, and you, you have accountability, but some flexibility in that where I would just shut shut off and go home for a couple hours and and just either curl up on a couch and, or just think or do something, just not realizing what the heck was going on. But a lot easier to mask in those days. And um, when your career path or my career path was going fairly well, uh, all those years, even easier to mask, right? Like I think money, um, uh, you know, helps people mask issues that they have, right? And, and we see a lot in the mental health space where everything can look, you know, somewhat normal and uh, not get chalked up to, some, you know, anything more than just people having your average average day stress, right, of, of, of life, you know, job and kids and stuff like that. But um, it really started to take a little bit more of a toll um, on me, uh, and I love my wife, love my kids, but just another pressure while work was going really well, having kids kind of all these things, you know, you would think otherwise might make me a little happier and they did, but might, you know, I thought would offset maybe the imbalances I had not understanding, you know, uh, anxiety and depression, other, other, other more than just seemed like weird mood swings or something that I couldn't control, or maybe I'd go to the gym more often and control it. And I just was trying to do things my way versus, sitting down with somebody and actually managing, you know, what, what, what is, has been, uh, you know, debilitating at times. So, um, so yeah, I did a lot of that with, with physicians over the years, like, you know, did my regular checkups, but enough to get whatever sort of anti-anxiety medicine and sometimes tried to take myself off. That's not recommended, that didn't recommend it at all. That's like, I just refused to admit that it was such a, such a problem. And, um, I, I, in the back of my head, knew knew that it affected more than I, and I wanted to help out with it. So local charities, local mental health organizations, always donate my time, you know, spend money at the auctions, whatever I could to raise awareness in that respect without really coming to grips with the fact and being open and admitting about it. So fast forward, um, you know, all those years of, of, of good growth, birth, growth, um, financially and family, you know, still dealing with these two issues. Um, and just over three years ago, I had a, a bad fall downstairs at our home here in Princeton and suffered a traumatic brain injury, which nearly killed me. Uh, if my wife hadn't found me in time, a couple of brain bleeds and stuff like that. And that gave me a, a huge opportunity um, to just start thinking about what the heck was going on in my life on the outside you know, could seem I've got a, you know, beautiful wife, beautiful daughter. Our son was, um, my wife was pregnant with my son at the time and, uh, you know, hitting every award at the, at work, going on trips, playing golf, you know, um, but still battling inside. And what, what that did is it gave me the opportunity after I started remembering what was going on. Cause I, I lost, uh, some memory for a couple of months there with the injury, the extent of the injury, but I just started to take a look at like the last 15, 20 years in terms of what was I looking for, right? You know, and 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 when I started to remember conversations with people a couple months after the accident, people would come in that, you know, I was friends with and say, why don't you tell me, you know, I would have helped and they were really reaching out. And I don't remember who I told, how I told people, you know, I was just battling a severe brain injury. Um, but I realized with talking with people, how much, how much better it made me, me feel from people who would share with me, Hey, my husband had a traumatic brain injury or, Hey, my kid's going through some concussion stuff. Could you speak with him? 
And I started feeling like not only better myself, um, but like I was doing more to share my experience of having such an injury, right? Um, and I would, you know, brain injuries happen a ton, right? In all different ways. So there's nothing embarrassing about it. You know, I fell down the stairs and uh, it happened. But I started to think about it as why am I so open about that? And I'm not that open about my mental health struggles. So I made a decision at that point to openly share um, proactively, not just reactively, like really find ways to do it. You know, um, with some good friends here in Princeton, uh, one, of, one of the guys I skated men's leagues with, he's uh, the global mental health ambassador for Johnson & Johnson, which is located here. I, I reached out to him and said, how else can I, can I hear, have people hear my voice? So that's where that, you know, uh, advocacy and mental health truly came, you know, was born, was just realizing just how powerful sharing the experience is with others. Um, and not just, and, and, and in my experience, being proactive about it versus just reactive, like finding opportunities to talk with people um, about it and, and, and further this cause that we're all, you know, trying to fight here. So, yeah, um, I think um, it's such an isolating feeling to be dealing with things like that. And I think talking about it more and finding a sense of community in the struggle um, definitely helps. I think, uh, don't want to speak for flow, but I think it's helped for both of us just kind of being able to have people come on and share their story. I think that's a huge, huge thing. Um, for people to feel more comfortable, you know, sharing their story and finding comfort in, in the community of it. And then, um, you know, just, uh, how did you said you suffer with anxiety and depression for 25 years now? Um, did you notice that before you realized, okay, this is anxiety and depression that there was hints of you know looking back and reflecting whether hints of it before you know when before that uh you really realized what it was of like, oh that that's that's what this was the whole time or and you know if you feel comfortable sharing what are some of the the things that give you anxiety and and you know kind of spiral you into that dark place of depression it, it, you know kind of the thoughts that can that can creep in if you feel comfortable sharing of course yeah those are good questions yeah and i and i do uh yeah, yeah, I can relate with you to that sense of community and, 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 and being open. And I think that's a lot easier when you, when you feel that sense of community or trust, right? But I, um, it's hard because I, I can't really go back um, and pinpoint like a time where, where I, f I felt depressed or I fe felt anxiety. I can't tell you, and I don't know if it has anything to do with either of those, is that when I was a kid, um, they, my, my nickname was in my house was uh, like Mr. Clean. Like I could never get to my house and see something like I'd always had to do the dishes or arrange that. I don't know whether it could be some other compulsive disorder, whatever it was, but, and I don't know whether that like has anything to do with anxiety and depression. I'm not sure. Like, you know, I, I could, I could do a very, very uneducated guess at the fact that it was always, you know, mentally something that I was like searching for, or trying to get out of or away from or whatever, whether it was, you know, growing up in a lower middle-class family. And I felt like, geez, you know, I, we deserve more, or, you know, I don't want to, you know, have my kids like this, who knows, but I can't pinpoint at one specific time. Cause I, you know, I think, you know, my college, my high school days and, and growing up days and, and then college and, um, you know, all seem fairly normal like I don't remember episodes where it would have it would have triggered it um so I, it's hard for me to think like what was like what was my first thought of it outside of um outside of that doctor actually that day saying I think you suffer from it and I was like I don't understand you put me through these tests where I had to remember things and this and that and you asked me questions and yeah, some of the questions on some of those tests are pretty out there. And I, I had no idea how you take that test and, just, and, and turn that into the anxiety and depression, right? I had no idea at the time. I was like, I can't be, like, there's no way. Yeah, I don't feel good sometimes. I feel lethargic, whatever. But I think, you know, for me personally, maybe when, when, when I was that young and you're playing hockey for a living and you're always staying in shape, as we know, exercise is a big combatant against 
stress, right? And and uh, so maybe it wasn't as as noticeable as when I started slowing down. You know, maybe when I didn't get the exercise that I needed, and and maybe uh, you know had a little bit more of those um, those fluctuations in, in in mood and stuff like that is really where I could say, well, yeah, that that feels like you know I'm depressed or uh, you know or maybe it was maybe the anxiety was always there but it just was dealt with in ways that i i didn't know it was being dealt with like i had said like the exercise right like you know if 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 i knew i had anxiety just exercise more right you know i mean i was exercising more anyway so maybe that just toned down the the anxiety levels for all those years right and maybe it was dormant if that maybe that's a better way to say and then when i started to slow down whether it was pick up things with work put my expectations with work up here, work out less, not get the time I need for rest, all that sort of stuff. And maybe that's where it started to spiral. And, you know, that led to, you know, it, you know, I don't, you know, it led to ways where, yeah, I would calm myself down a little bit more. Maybe, you know, have a few drinks, calm down. Okay, that seems fine because that seems normal, right? Okay, that seems fine, normal, I'm holding the good job. You know, does a, does a few beers calm me down? Sure, well, every, you know, it seems like at the time when things are going 900 miles per hour, maybe everybody drinks. It, it, we realize they don't, right? But it didn't seem anything more than just, hey, that's it. the common phrase, you know, take the edge off, stuff like that. And that's where I would say I probably should have seen somebody like when my career started picking up in the, in the, in the financial world, the mortgage world, to start addressing it better. But I can't, you know, what triggers it is just what used to trigger it is a little bit of everything, right? Like, like there's an expectation of how days are going to go. And they're, in my opinion, they're unrealistic because unless you're locking yourself into a room, talking to nobody, not looking at the phone call and just saying, I'm going to read this book from cover to cover, you know, without outside interference, um, there's probably a pretty good chance that once you're outside of that room and, and, and life starts coming at you, whether it's driving in the car or being at work or with kids, just things start piling up and it's a matter of starting how do you handle all those different um, things coming at you? And with work, um, and, I, and, I, and I believe you have firsthand knowledge of this, Danny, with that, and the mortgage business is, is there's a lot of stuff that can come at you, right? And, and, and it's not always like anticipated. So maybe with that and getting busier and then you know, not handling it, maybe just snowball. But I think, I think not understanding how to take a, take a pause or a deep breath and realize like you've been in this instance before, you'll get through it. If I can't, if I don't know those triggers and I didn't have them for a long time or I didn't know it was triggering it, it was very hard to realize that I was going to start having, you know, the anxiety and sometimes getting into panic attacks and stuff like that. But um, it right Nowadays, um, I don't think, I, I know it's not fleshed out of my system by no means. I mean, I can tell you what, what, what combats depression is gratitude. That's, that's one, one definite thing, gratitude, right? Um, you know, the anxiety, it's just, you know, I've had, I had to learn how to live with a brain injury in terms of what I could take in. So it was kind of doctor's orders, like you can't work this amount. You can't be running a 14 person team with all these people coming at you. You just need to slow down your brain to recover. And that's kind of how I modeled my life. Like I've gotten better for sure. I'm not out of the woods yet in terms of recovery from the injury, even after three years, but I just won't let myself go back there to start putting more variables or have more variables come at me than there already does with having a full-time job, trying to help out, um, and, you know, folks in, in the advocacy and, and starting a company and having a three and a half year old and a or five and a half year old and two and a half year old. So I try to really limit it. Like I, I think, as you guys know, as and many people know out there is the, um, is for, you know, for me, and, and hopefully you can write is it, the, the thoughts snowball on my head. Like, and if I can't figure, if I can't clip them off early, in terms of just realizing, just breathe, like then that's where it would get really bad, where I would have to go just shut down for a little bit, right? Now, you know, now I can, I can, I can feel stuff coming on and whether it's go get up, take a walk, take a breath, take a, you know, grab a water, talk to somebody, whatever, um, you know, they don't, they don't come as often and they don't, 
thankfully get nearly anywhere as bad as they used to. They're not as debilitating, but I have to keep an eye out for them if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It uh and it's the timing of that is actually kind of funny. Like I know that feeling all too well. I kind of past two days have been like just out of the blue randomly um like super dark for me. And I kind of noticed that pattern that you were just saying. The example that you just gave of like Kiff, like flow smile. I think uh, maybe he, he gets it too, but I'm sure. But I uh, I noticed that pattern was starting, and it just like I tried to nip it in the butt, and or nip it in the butt, whatever the term is. But like I tried to nip it right there from the start, and like I just like couldn't, and it kept going and going. And like I was up till like three in the morning last night, like so, like in my car in the park, like just having like honestly like sick thoughts and it was like a really dark and and tough uh tough time and like now like monday like day after i'm like shooken up from that and it's like it just compounds and my point being is that um you know maybe it's different things that both of us struggle with or the three of us struggle with but the the the, the mindset of it like the the way it develops is pretty much all the same it's just a matter of like being able to stop it in its tracks it's so hard it really is hard to do that. Um, how have you found, what are some of the things that you do when you notice, okay, like I'm starting to, you know, spiral, so to speak. Um, I got to switch my, my framework of thinking here. How, how, what's the way that you kind of, um, you know, kind of deal with that? That's a good question. Um, I, I, the first thing is I just breathe. Like I, I just have to get, like, it's a pause button. Right. And that's that's everything from how I interact with people that I, you know, um, that sometimes if I get a little testy or I want to, you know, um, I've never been one to be like really rude or brash with people. But if I really if people start egging me on and not 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 trying to egg me on, but just the conversation itself, like if you're around people or I'm in a situation. I just learned to bite my tongue and think about it a little bit more like, you know, that, so that that's another way to pause, right? For me, um, if I'm around people, which I, you know, I try not to isolate myself um, much at all. Like even in, in my small office here, there's a couple other, you know, uh, little firms here and I'll get up and just walk and talk to people because I know sitting here thinking about it, it's not going to help. And that sometimes if you're around people that you know, you love and you like, it's just any conversation about anything just takes your mind away from it. I mean, I can tell you like, um, and you guys are young, young bucks, but, uh, you know, my kids, you know, just, just seeing a picture or just thinking of a drawing or something. I mean, it just totally grounds me and just makes me uh, much more aware that, you know, as they say, this too shall pass. Like, I, you know, it just seems like at the time, like, you know, when you're go when you're in the middle of it, like it just, so hard to explain to people who haven't dealt with it, but it, I just got to go and ground myself in terms of uh, either either getting up for a walk, talking to somebody, taking a look, thinking things through and being like, okay, you, you, you've you handled this before effectively, right? Um, just like m many other things we've done uh, in our lives, whether it's, you know, if you, if you need, if, you, if your shot wasn't good, you, you know how to work on your shot, right? You might get some help, right? But things you would try to fix automatically you know, probably in the early on stage with, or even any time, like trying to do it yourself is no good, right? But I think, you know, for me, understanding, catching those triggers and just doing what works for me, um, you know, has helped me a ton. And I, you know, it could be different for everybody. Like I, maybe I should say, instead of, um, you know, look at pictures and do 10 push-ups. I don't know. Whatever the routine is to snap me out of it, right? Um, but I think best, I think best, when things used to get pretty bad, I, I made sure to get in front of somebody and just say, hey, I'm not feeling well. Like people somebody that I trusted, right? Or that knew, because I think that's when it can really get out of hand for some people. But I just try to break the routine as much as possible. Like, you know, or just, just break whatever patterns putting my head in that, whether it's um, work or whether it's, you know, bills coming up or whatever it is, right? Um, and sometimes like for me with work, sometimes if I just don't feel right, I, I have to, I had to be conscious of having clients in a company that I work with. Right. But I also had to be conscious that if I'm not good, 
physically or mentally, I'm no good to anybody. So sometimes I'll just shut down and just go home early, see the kids. That right there, you know, um, is a game changer for me um, until they start screaming at me, and uh, <laughs> which is still fine. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm here to do it. So not, um, I mean, I just try to stick with what I know works, right? Until it doesn't, you know, but I, I know like w when it was, the other methods I was trying to handle it before was, you know, before marriage and uh, even even through marriage was um, they weren't the right ways for me. You know, like I, I have nothing against people picking up a drink. I, I, from my head injury, I haven't, you know, it wasn't from my neurologist like, yeah, hey, you probably should change your eating around a bit. I shouldn't have alcohol. Um, all this sort of I haven't had a drink in three years. I just, it, I'm glad it's kind of knocked it out of me. I just don't see the benefit for me I you know and um just because things have been such such on a good progression you know and I, I especially with head injuries and having anxiety and all the stuff on CTE and all the stuff out there I, I think there's something in between these unfortunate things that that people go through and happen to people and I just won't create that bridge you know, if, if I have a choice I'm just not going to create it but yeah I wish you know I think it just talking like to guys like you or people like you and um you know maybe there's something else that works better for me you know like i, I don't know I, it works for now i'm not saying that just like in my diet like i i, I stopped uh, eating as much bread because i have a gluten sensitivity i never knew it until i went through a recent uh, test but i feel 100 percent better 99 percent better than i did but you know um I think it's just figuring out what works for people. And somebody just suggested to me, once you try to take it out of your diet a little bit, even before I was doing the blood test and I felt better. And then I had the blood test and like, yeah, you have a sensitivity to it. So I think you've got to, you know, within proper somewhat regulated guidelines, do what works for you. And if it just, if it isn't effective long-term, you know, do, do like what we're doing, talk, reach out and talk to people. There's a, there's a lot of people out there that have gone through it. Um, you know, and it seems like there's more people that are willing to share it when you're open and honest and, and can form that sense of community or sense of bond with them, right? Yeah, it, you know, um, how have you felt as an athlete, like the stuff that you struggle with, did it help you? I mean, you, you said that, you know, being an athlete was great because you had, you know, the energy was being released in ways, but did you find that, you know, being a professional athlete that, it also did affect um, your mental health. And then talk about the transition from going from being a professional athlete into the working world and um, kind of shifting gears. Cause I don't think many people realize how difficult that is. Um, and even people can talk about it till they're blue in the face and how tough it is. But when you're actually experiencing that transition, it's a lot harder than people kind of describe. Um, just kind of talk about your experience with that. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, uh, that's a good topic to cover. Um, I, I didn't, there wasn't a lot, like I was never like that incredible of a hockey player where I, I knew I would have a place to play. Like if a coach didn't like me or, you know, if I fell out of ways with, with one organization or the other. So I didn't put a lot of pressure on myself while I was playing hockey, you know, um, I was just happy to be there um, in terms of, and grateful to be for there, or at least I thought I was then. So I didn't put a lot of pressure when I was playing hockey on myself in terms of my ability. Like I, you know, I look at it now and say, well, geez, me, you know, and I, and I, in my later years, see guys that, although it's the minors, you know, they did put pressure on themselves in a good way, I would say, in terms of taking a little bit more seriously than, than I did. And they were awarded opportunities or so rewarded opportunities for that, right? Like I saw a progression of guys in the US Coast Hockey League two years later winning the Stanley Cup three years later right but I saw what it took to get there I just never really maybe gave my chance self a chance or just so I didn't really have that um pressure to perform I would I was athletic you know and I'm competitive for sure but I really didn't it didn't bother me whether I had a 20 point season or a 10 point season or a 40 board season right like and maybe it was a little bit different at those levels um, where, you know, at least when I was playing, you weren't getting a, a huge amount of bonuses like the guys in the NHL and stuff are now um, for hitting those marks, which could be, you know, 
you know, the, those guys are so good that it just, you know, um, that, that, it, that it's meant, it means more, much more. So I can see some crazy stress and anxiety on, on those individuals, regardless of whatever sport it was. But I think the, um, I don't know if it, if it really, if the sport itself um, triggered any of it, you know, um, I would just was having a great time. It was like an extension that I, that I didn't really think was going to happen it, but it helped me, helped me put off having to, knowing that I was going to go play hockey, helped me put off what I knew I would eventually inevitably have to do is go get a job, right? Or go into the workforce, right? Um, that transition for me, I, I just, I was lucky enough to have friends in our industry. And my thought was, okay, I'm going to stop sometime and I'm going to uh, probably take a job somewhere and I'll do something. That was the extent of it. Even having a good college education, um, my whole thing was, I'll make it back to the Northeast and maybe go to New York. I got a lot of friends that have been working for four or five years and I'll figure out something. And I kind of got my first job, uh, was, was offered a first job through my college roommate's family who owned, uh, it was big in the real estate business here. So that was like my transition piece. So I kind of really didn't have a lot to do with, with, with how I could see it, you know, if in terms of transitioning over into the working world, but it's still, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Like, I really thought I'd be here making a little bit more money, not having knee surgeries every year, not getting punched in the face for 350 bucks a week. Um, maybe a couple of bucks under the table, who knows, but <laughs> the, uh, um, the, uh, but, uh, I really thought it was, I'll figure my stuff out here. And then I'll go into New York. And then I, again, I put myself right back into the hockey community, started playing with Trenton the next year, started skating with the guys. So I was always comfortable in that sense and always kind of almost put off work. And in our career that, that since 98, the mortgage industry has been, you know, outside of a couple of years has been, you know, pretty solid. And it gives me the flexibility, or at least it gave me the flexibility to kind of make some good money, make some great relationships, do a lot of fun things and not have a, um, you know, a standard, and I don't want to say standard or put the wrong word there. It's like a nine to five job where I had to be somewhere at some point. So there was a lot of flexibility, which now I realized, uh, I don't know whether that helped my mental health journey or not. Um, I'm not sure, but I, I, I see it all the time now. Like I, you know, I, you know, and I, and I want to get better at talking to people about it. And if I can help out in, in, in that, in that equation with people that are, playing sports now or transitioning from college sports to professional sports or professional sports to the, the working world or life after, I think that the general public at times might think, well, geez, yeah, it's got to be easy for the guy who captained the New York Rangers to get a job or, you know, somebody who played in the NHL to go get a job somewhere. I don't think it is as much, right? Like it's not a natural transition, especially if it's in something outside of the, the sport you chose to, to, to hang your hat on for a while. Um, so I do think there's a huge need for, for almost, a, and, and there probably exists in some sports, almost a mentoring program. And I see it evolving in other sports and I see it evolving in hockey a little bit where there is a willingness to say, hey, well, you know, when I, when I, um, when I had downtime, um, I used to read a book every now and then, but it was, you know, the bus rides are playing cards in the back having a cup of beers, staying up too late, you know, wrestling off my bunk and the, the thing, whoever gave me the most money. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't bettering myself. Right. You know, and it, you know, it's a quick, quick story. There's a young guy from, from Hamilton who's playing in the, in the ECHL now. Um, and I've known of the alumni association. I called him up in his first year, a couple of years ago. And I said, Hey, uh, one, one suggestion less time in the back of the bus playing cards and drinking beers, more time up front studying. And he said, Scott, you're old. He goes, it's not like that anymore. So, uh, um, but no, I think that transition's tough. Like I think, uh, you know, you've, you've got to be very proactive and not, not as an athlete, um, just assume you're going to have a seat at the table or be able to make a phone call to somebody when you're out of the sport. I mean, I think there's a, there's obviously a good percentage or a, there's a percentage of people in any sport that are going to have that, you know, based upon, um, 
based upon the relationships. I can go, sorry to be tangential, but you know, if you look at a sport like golf, right? Those guys are getting paid millions of dollars to endorse companies, but they're also like, I think, yeah, this is directly, I just, I just thought about it now. Um, you know, they're going to outings to whether they're sponsored by Amex or Zurich or whatever, where they're meeting people, they're networking, they're talking, they're presenting. And the hockey world, at least when I played, there wasn't a lot of that, right? Um, you know, so there, there wasn't that natural come out of something you've been doing for 30, 40 years and all of a sudden just fit into general society or in terms of what are the career you want. So, yeah, I think there needs to be a better, uh, there, 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 there need to be more avenues and, and the more people out there that realize that and the more people out there that are helping, um, you know, the better. And I think, you know, the hockey community, just like other communities out there, are just so well it's just such a close community, whether you played minors in the WHL or you played 20 years in the NHL, it always seems to, to get you a seat at the table with another hockey guy. And you've got everybody from, you know, you know, U.S. Olympians and high finance now to guys still in hockey coaching. I mean, I think there's, if, if, you, if you put your head down and you work a little bit, um, especially while you're in the sport, I think that's where the transition, um, it's not easy, but could get easier for some people to get, you know, when they hang up the skates, so. Yeah. It, what's something that you think it was, you know, beneficial for you in that transition? Obviously, like you said, the people that you're surrounded by and whatnot, but, you know, some advice or a thought process that you had, because obviously hockey players are competitive, you know, we go hundred miles an hour with everything we do. What are some of the things that, you know, maybe six months after you retired, started a new job, you get those thoughts, oh, I miss playing, things like that. What was the, you know, the mindset that you had that kind of allowed you to accept that transition a little easier than, you know, expected or whatnot? That's a good question. Um, I'll see if I can answer it properly. Um, I'm sure, you know, being an athlete, whether it was professionally or, or just being an athlete in general, like there was some level of wanting to succeed in whatever I did, right? Um, I, I, I couldn't tell you at the time that people were saying, if you work this hard, you'll make this amount. If you work this hard, this. I knew it was going to be more than I was making playing hockey <laughs> um, or, you know, um, you know, would it be as much fun? Um, no, but that's my, where my mindset was there. Um, I, I think it helped me personally to get into a job that um, like other sales type jobs are more relationship based, right? Um, a little bit more flexibility. Um, but, you know, I think that's where, you know, I saw the the benefit of, of putting time in and seeing the results, right? Um, I also saw the other side of it where that, uh, that early on, I was like, this isn't a career for me where, you know, I was new to the business and, you know, trying to forge relationships, but other people who had been in that, this area um, doing what I've done for years had already had those relationships. So it was a matter of how do I build my own relationships so it became frustrating and I, I was never the one. I mean, as you guys know, like when you're playing a professional sport, um, I never expected to be catered to, but you were catered to, right? Like you had fan base, like you, you can, you know, I, I, did, I took advantage of it only in a good way. Like if somebody said, hey, Scott, you like golf, you go play. It wasn't like I was out there being like, hey, I'm a Memphis River King, I should be able to go play TBC. You know, I, I didn't take it that way, but I, you know, it just seemed like now I had to cater to people which run me the wrong way. Like I was like, there's no way that I'm gonna survive in this business. And what, so what, what I did is I said, hey, it's, a job is better than no job, right? It's not like um, I had bills to pay. Um, I, I put my head down, tried to figure out how I can make it work. What really helped me was I, I supplemented it that first year or so with doing lessons and staying involved with hockey people because a lot of the team the guys that I a lot of around here there wasn't as much competitiveness in hockey so I'd go to New York City right and there was a lot of good connection there so I said hey as long as I have a job pay 
afford to do this and that. I could do some lessons in the morning. I started to meet more people that knew me as Scott, the hockey guy versus maybe Scott, a guy who can get you the mortgage, right? So I look back at it and, and even with building my current platform is, um, which is all relationship based is how, how lucky that was or how fortunate I am that, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't have the urge to go back in the hockey world, even though I coached for eight or nine years and served on the board and stuff like that. I just, you know, I, I feel like I needed that part of my life just to help give back a little bit. But I think the, the, the best thing that I gained out of that was an awareness that, you know, um, relationships matter most, you know, and, um, and that's why I kept my head down. I was building some relationships with some key people because they knew me first as the hockey person that coached their kid. And then they'd see me walking at it 7.38 in the morning with a suit and tie, because I thought every mortgage guy has to wear a suit and tie every day, which uh, um, I tried for a while. And they'd say, what else do you do, right? So they got to know me first as Scott, somebody who's taking care of my kid. And then it started to snowball from there. Like, you know, that the, the, the Trenton was in here with the team. People knew me. I was in the paper because I was working. But um, I think, I think um, for the most part, I think my, my athletic background got me through a lot of that and caused me a little bit of awareness that, you know, things aren't just handed to you, you know? Um, and I think that the one thing, one thing I would learn from it is I didn't do a lot of prep work, right? Like I didn't, I didn't, the company I worked for was great. The people were very supportive, had a good career there. Um, the, I didn't really, I got a job and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this and be here. It was like, who am I going to be working with? Right. And, um, and it took me a while to really not only understand the business, but also understand why people were like they were where I was working. And I say that in the lo as most loving way as possible, but it was like dog eat dog. Nobody wanted to help out because your sale was here. And I felt more isolated and alone, like, oh my goodness, I got to go it alone. And a couple other things happened with friends leaving the business that I thought would be Hey, I'm their friend. They're going to be giving me their business, right? Um, but um, I think I, I just didn't prepare enough. I took a job for the sake of taking a job, which I'm I'm grateful for now because I've had a great time and 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 I'm still uh, working in the mortgage industry. So um, but yeah, I think I think more preparation, like anything else, you got to know. And it's even when, when you're in a job, transitioning to a job, whether it's in the same industry or not, it's just not as easy sometimes as people think. And there's, well, if I go there, I'll have it much better because, you know, he or she said it would. You just got to really, you know, um, prepare a little bit better. If that, I, I'm not sure well, if that answered your question. Or not. Uh, absolutely. And I think that's a, what you said about, you know, being known as a hockey guy. I know for me is that's kind of like where the fear of retiring kind of comes into plays. Cause all I've kind of been known as is the hockey guy. So it's like, are people going to forget about me or are people going to, you know, not be as entertained with me? Cause you know, I don't play hockey anymore. And hearing you say that kind of like gives me a sense of relief because you know, you're saying you is everything's relationship based and you know, you've had, great success and whatnot so it definitely does help and I know with I know Danny and all my buddies biggest thing is people being you know so hesitant to retire because of you know that exact reason so I think a lot of people will benefit from what you just said because that's the struggle they have is being hung up on the hockey guy so I it answered it perfectly yeah, you know, I think it's, I, I think you can, I'm 100% convinced whether you're a hockey guy, uh, athlete or not, and it's been shown in studies, um, I don't remember the name of it, but there's, you know, in the power of relationships, and I can be go both ways, like, right, and you always, you know, always hear it's, you know, who you surround yourself with, right, both good and bad, right, um, but I think the more the, the, the better of a relationship person you can be or the, the stronger you can, you can forge or, and it's not like everyone, right? You gotta, I think the better, the, the, the better you can get at identifying which relationships work for you, 
without being crass and say, I don't want to talk to anybody over there. I don't want to do this. I mean, be, with understanding of other people's opinions and why they do what they do, but, and not let it affect you in terms of, hey, here's the type of people, whether it's, you know, people I admire because they've done, went from here to here, people that my, you know, my uncle who did this to this, like the more people you can find with similar interests and, you know, people kind of in that, um, in that space, so to speak, and unless you identify, but without, that, that's only coming after really knowing the person, right? Um, and I, I hope, sorry to be too tangential on this, but that's, our, our society is so fast and we're so, especially in the business world, we're going 900 miles per hour where the common thing is, oh, hey, hey Flo, what do you do? Hey, D Danny, what do you do? Like, it's all like, what do you do? Like, not who you are, right? And like, I know it would be weird to go up to me like, oh, hey, Danny, who are you, right? Uh, like, because a lot of people, I, I really truly, and this might be going way tangential, I, I really truly believe a lot of people don't know that they're not to themselves, right? And that's a lot of self-discovery and stuff like that, right? And that's where, yeah, I could I could have taken my accident and been like, oh, poor me, and kind of been like, oh, geez, someone had to, you know, live with this, you know, bad memory and, you know, whatever, or I can I can really figure out, okay, what, what do I need to do to make myself better? And who the heck am I, right? Um, but I think that the sooner you can get to figuring that out without like giving somebody a checklist and say, no, nah, I'm not going to do with you. Right. Just kind of really understanding what they're all about and, um, and, and build from those relationships, because once you form that bond, you know, with somebody that trusting bond, whether it's in a, the hockey community or whether it's friend of a friend, family where somebody knows, you know, the, person behind the persona right we all have these personas like we've got to be this tough rugged hockey guy got to be this really successful business guy but the real true person behind it once you can get to know some of that then the mo most of the time people will trust you with anything like where we can go to somebody and be like listen i really don't like i know i'm not going to be playing much longer i don't want to wait until the spring of next year to decide that i didn't get the contract that i want i should go work i'd rather tell you what I, you know, what I'm thinking about doing, would you know anybody that I could talk to? So while you're playing this season out or the next season out, you can have those conversations. Like, I truly believe like if somebody said, Hey, can you talk to this guy? He's currently playing here 100%. Cause that gets me excited. Right. I try to stay in touch with people in the hockey world, even people that aren't in the hockey world who are hockey fans. 100%, right? Yeah, I would love to talk to him. Like, what's he doing? Oh, he's playing professional hockey. You know, he went to he went to Providence. You know, he's playing in the minors. Oh my God, he's trying to live his dream. Great. Yeah, I realize it's not gonna, you know, go on for the next 40 years, but you, you have a seat at the table more than you think. So I think those, you know, my whole, I started beating up in all these old adages, right? Like, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And like that simple one I always pick on because it's like, it is what you know. You gotta be somewhat competent, right? To be able to have some level of um, some level of performance or trust in somebody, but you, it is who you know, both good and bad, right? You want to surround yourself with good people, and obviously, sometimes that brings opportunities for the better, or for the worse, depending upon your choices. But it, it, it's how well you know them, right? Like I, I know one thing: like if if I know I can come up to Boston right now, and pretty much. Or I could send a lot of friends up here who I trust to friends of mine in Boston and be like, listen, please get them into your restaurant. Please get them on your golf course, not to show off or anything, because I trust them enough. And that person or a couple of friends of mine in Boston trust me enough that I wouldn't put their career, life, reputation at stake to just get some sort of business gain or some whatever out of it. Right. So I think and it, that goes into the whole inner circle. I don't know. That's a. I don't, there's probably a better word for it, but you know, I think the more the more of those relationships um, you can build while you're while you're still actively pursuing, um, you know, the hockey career or the career you are, versus just jumping out and cold turkey, start calling people like I just stopped playing hockey. Now what? Right? I think that doesn't help too mentally. Like that that puts a lot of pressure on it because you might you know. Somebody that you know, once you start, or you know, but may not know really well, might be that person that knows somebody that gives you the break you're looking for, or the connection you're looking for, or just time to talk, you know, and I think there's more guys in our world doing it now, 
you know, in terms of, you know, that transitioning part. And, um, you know, I think it, it's a common question out there is how do we help lessen that blow, so to speak, for people going through it? Because that does, that does you no good right now while you're on the ice thinking about it, right? You know, you, and it's not like somebody's just going to come and gift wrap you. You know, hey, this is going to be great when you stop playing. There's, but there's, there's got to be something less threatening, for lack of a better term, um, to people currently knowing that that time is going to come where you have to make that decision. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard one. And I actually just had this conversation with a buddy yesterday. Um, I was just kind of telling him, I mean, we were just talking, shooting the shit about, you know, life or whatever. And uh, one thing I told him was just like, not that I'm wise by any means or nothing like that, but um, I just told him like, you know, this off season, you know, try everything, just find other things that you're interested in and other things that you might be good at. Um, Cause he still has many years of playing ahead of him. So he's lucky in that regard. But, you know, for me, like, I, I was have every intention of playing this year and then COVID happened and I just kind of gotten, you know, punched in the mouth so to speak and like was forced almost into retirement and like it's just been recently where I've been kind of people ask if I'm playing or what the deal was or just recently I've been kind of verbally saying even though I think I'm done I'm pretty confident I'm done I've been verbalizing it now to people like oh I'm it's I'm done it's behind me and I think yesterday that's kind of why um I was in such a dark place because I actually started to reflect on the fact that hockey and what I know of it and what it was is officially behind me and I think coming to that realization, I've kind of also realized that um, there's nothing in my life ever again that I'm going to ever like have the same sense of fulfillment for the rest of my life. And I just know like hockey was like such an important piece of that. And it was everything to me and like it hurts a lot. So like, you know, just kind of talking to buddies about that. I think it's just like it's so important to find other stuff that you like and other stuff that you can kind of be passionate about while you're playing. I mean, you have so much free time. It's important to get out there and explore that because once it ends, like there's nothing like it. Um, and I've been lucky enough where like there's other, you know, I have opportunities to get into the working world and honestly make some good money, but I just know that it's not going to give me the same sense of fulfillment and just kind of knowing that really hurts. So I just, you know, I think that's the biggest thing is guys that are playing pro right now or whatever the case is, like you have so much time on your hands, you know, try and utilize that to honestly, like it sounds corny, but like, go to a dance class, like go to an art studio, like pick up photography. Like, I don't know, like if you're, if you're living in a, you know, you know, place that, you know, has like rivers and lakes, try fishing something just to get out of it. Cause once it ends, it's like, you're, you're never going to get that same feeling. I'm thinking, um, I don't know if you can resonate with those feelings and um, didn't mean to go on, off on a tangent there, but it's just like so relatable kind of what you're talking about. Uh, like, I literally just have been like coming to that realization. I was wondering if you have, you know, had those same feelings of like I almost like a worthlessness and just like not knowing like like how scary the future is without hockey, you know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're we're I, I think that's very well said, Daddy. And I think um and and so the, the comments you guys make are all on point. Like I it's hard, like I have to rewind myself like two decades, right, to be in your chairs because I'm much older than you guys. Um yeah, I I don't know whether I, I would never argue that, that, um, that thought in terms of there'll, there'll never be anything else like it, right? Because we're so used to it, right? Um, it's like our natural high, like, like going to the ring, playing a game, you know? Um, I, I, I would actually say, you know what, I, I would agree. It'd be hard for me to agree and say, well, what about having a wife and kids or like kids, right? Like, cause that's not, I don't know, no, no, yes, well, like it's not happening tomorrow, right? So you've got this, this, this portion of your life that you're going to be going through. Like, you know, I was so used to doing this and now I have to admit, like really admit, like you said, that it's that, that part's behind me, right? I think like anything else, um, and if you do, if you're, if you're used to doing something that long and that was your passion, that it's so hard to unwind mentally from right like you like you're all but I, I would argue you'll always have that in your life just because you're an athlete and it's a great community and it's in your blood um, and that can transfer over to whatever sort of community people are in right whether it's football athletes art 
you know, um, education, stuff like that. Um, and I think myself, like I thought that too, I was like, I, I've got to be the only person, like not only person, but there's, you know, us athletes are the only people that go through it. I, I would think it's cross culture, right? It's like everybody, because it's like you're, it's like a piece of you is like going away. Um, I think what I've tried to do is just learn from it, right? And, and I wasn't looking for something to replace it with. It just kind of flowed. And I don't know whether that's good or bad, right? Like, you know, there was a lot of years in between, you know, stopping to play. I look at it now and I'm like, oh my goodness, the last game I played was 2004. But I still had that adult league and stuff like that where I made some incredible relationships. Was it the same? No, we did win six or seven national checking adult league championships in a row. It's pretty, pretty good. But uh, I know it's hard to replace. And it seems like when you're in it and you made that decision, like, whoa, because you're still young, you're still in shape. You could probably, you know, a new team could pop into Morristown next year and the coast and be like, hey, Danny, can you come try? I mean, that's what happened with me. And, but, you know, and I say that in jest, I, I don't mean that in any, like, I, it's hard to pull away from it. Like, but I think that, because there's, there's something out there that how can anything be so as powerful and as attractive to me as what hockey was, right? I was like that when I was a kid. Baseball never was like that. I played it. Football was never like that. I played it, liked it, but it was hockey, 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 right? And then it's like, I, I think I, for me, I've just had to learn to take as much good out as anything as I can, whether, whether it's a bad situation I put myself in or went through, or whether it's, um, you know, lessons I've actually learned through playing sports in terms of, geez, no wonder why I didn't get above this level because I didn't really, I, I took it all for granted, right? You know, I didn't try hard enough, or I didn't practice hard enough, right? Um, but, but, but I, but I I'd be hard to say that I haven't. I've I've found it in other ways, whether it's family, kids, whether it's uh, you know more on a, a more religious journey, just trying to figure stuff out there. I'm just trying to be a, a consistent learner, like learn more about myself, learn more about other people, learn more about just life in general. Um, it still tugs at me, like I. When we moved a couple of years ago, I had my hockey bag. It was nine months after my injury, and I almost threw it in the trash. Like I was like, I don't know, we're gonna play again. I still have it. I don't know, I don't know why, but it's because I don't want to give that. It's not because it has a cool like logo on it. You know, it's it's not because I want to sit around my kids two and a half for the next fifteen years. Um, but yeah, it's hard to it's hard to let go, and I think that's where like anything else, and I know it seems hard at times, I think this is you just got to find somebody that will listen, that has that shared experience. Better if they've had that shared experience, but just somebody to listen, like, hey, this is what I'm going through. And somebody to honestly and openly say, Danny, I can't relate because I never had to step out of a professional hockey career or whatever, but I can tell you one thing. I have gone through some things here, so I've handled it. Or you know what? my cousin did the same thing. He was playing here and had this talk to him now, you know, something like that. So the more, but I think that's just what you're doing with you guys are doing here is trying to put yourself in front of and talk to people that have gone through it and just, you know, I think throwing it out there and being willing and able to help and talk about it. You know, I think if you haven't seen it come back like in spades yet, it will like just that law of attraction, you know? Um, yeah. But I think it's like, anything else pick up the phone and talk to somebody like you don't want those things to spiral you know um because i don't think it's hard to explain to people that haven't been it just like anything else like what do you mean kid you're older you had an injury you know it's not going anywhere you weren't making it to the devils you weren't making i don't know who your team is but you know yeah you had to go to work sometime it still doesn't help like you know having somebody say that to you, it doesn't help you know having known that even before you you know, it just doesn't help. I know until you're in those shoes individually, it's hard to, it's hard to, to explain, you know, but. Yeah. yeah I mean, we don't want to, uh, I mean, that's just wise words and I, you know, 
I think, um, you know, I'm going to listen to this one again, that those parts and just kind of make sure they, you know, stick because I think it's important. Um, and like I said, we don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, I don't know if Flo has anything else for you, but if you don't mind, just quickly, um, just, you know, two things. If you don't mind, you know, talking about Sherapy and what you have going on over there with that. And, um, you know, I think you give a lot of great advice, but if there was kind of one final, um, you know, key thing that you wanted to say to someone who um, maybe went through the same thing that you were going through or some goes through some of the same things that you go through, just a piece of advice that you would want to, you know, maybe your younger self to know, or maybe you want someone else to know. Yeah, no, I'd have to touch on both of those for sure. Um, so we talked a little bit about kind of my history, my accident, kind of what that looked like after in terms of just trying to figure out what was going on with myself, right? And then I basically what I've done with therapy is I kind of I kind of went through kind of that lifespan of you know how I had successes and and work and and just just in general and kind of what 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 I could pin it towards right because I was like is this I wasn't sure whether the mortgage career I'd be able to sustain when I was doing the mortgage career right in one way shape or form just because of limitations so it basically was therapy is you know I think over the course of a year of just thinking and talking to people and realizing that the one thing that got me through all the troubles whether it was mental health issues whether it was through stuff at college whether it was through playing hockey with or through the working world was relationships and then I started saying well what you know how did I have such good relationships it, it was through good coaching good training working with some good people you know having some great teams and such and I basically was saying well geez like this world is spinning 500 miles thousand miles per hour and everybody's got a lot of uh, a lot of things going on at once and, and and at the end of the day I said we all need, we had to find a way to to slow the world down and I know it's hard because nothing's free or, you know you just can't you got to make money you know most people to you know life's not free um and I just said how how was I so successful or why did I have such good success in terms of raising teams and having some of the most productive teams in the country in the mortgage industry and it was all built on trust right and then I started talking thinking about community about how much our hockey community meant to me how much my college community meant to me so I started thinking trust community success you know shared experience with mental health with my trade injury and I'm thinking you know what a lot of people aren't willing to share and that uh, right now gets into you know well yeah well some people don't want to talk about mental illness some people don't want to talk about this all that vulnerability stuff but there's more to it like people who have a lot of experience that is outside of what they're currently doing so in the business end of it we typically want to say oh what do you do what do you do what do you do just add one more thing what do you do for fun try to learn more about the person because there's more to latch on to. So the quicker we can build trust, the quicker we can build community, and, and it's all by leveraging personal and professional experience, both good and bad. I believe it's a platform where we can bridge that gap between where people are and where they wanna be. Um, we're not gonna be tell telling people that they should be making X amount in the industry or they should weigh this amount or whatever. Whatever their goals are, there's enough people out there that'll be in the Sherby community that are currently, that will help you find your way there in a more efficient, more meaningful way. What it means is that you don't have to be 50 to look back and be like, what the heck was I doing all my life? My kids missed half of my thing. I was chasing after this and why. So by leveraging relationships, by leveraging or by building relationships, um, both personally and professionally and leveraging and tapping into human experience like we've done here, right? Like we will help people, give them personal and professional activities for growth and help them lead a more meaningful and happy life. So it's by building these little communities, like we'll have communities within the communities, like the hockey community is a great one, right? But the Sherby community, local, like know thy neighbor, know what's going on, invest in your neighbors, invest in your community. But it's also like being able to reach out to a buddy that's in your hockey world, the community that you played college with, whatever that's, I don't know, in California and say, you know, hey, I got a good buddy, you know, I played hockey with, I trust him, you know, he's doing this, he's looking to do something. So how do you leverage that on one form? I think a lot of the platforms out there are great in terms of connections. Um, this isn't meant to be a social media engine, you know, it's going to be kind of member, invite, build it kind of from the ground up and not just open the doors and let people pay money to be involved in another Platform. But I truly believe by, by evidence of what I've seen in the past in terms of my history of growing teams and relationships and other people I've talked to in all different industries around the world, that it's something that we can help build community. And whether it's somebody coming in there to realize I need to connect with more people, 
or whether it's somebody that comes in there and says, hey, I, I need uh, uh, not the connection part, I need the growth part, three common pillars, growth, connection, contribution, or hey, I've got a lot of success, I wanna contribute more, right? So there's three pillars of therapy, growth, connection, contribution, come into one, I know you'll leave with the rest or you'll leave with more. You know, by virtue of being able to listen to people, by able to just start having more empathy or having more understanding what people are going through. And maybe you can't relate to what somebody's going to, but if you're part of a community that's a loving community, like a hockey community as another communities, and you can say, hey, Danny, I don't know anybody in that area, but, um, or I'm not into that, especially, but I heard you, you know, my buddies, you should talk to. So I think it can slow things down. I know it can give people a, a level of understanding that life is short, that you don't have to work 90 hours a week um, and to help build more meaningful relationships to be able to get to, like I said, get to where you want in a more efficient, maybe less costly way. If I can free time up for you, and some resources, it's your option to do with the time and resources what you want. People can invest it back in their careers, right? I choose to take my time and resources and invest it back in family and the communities which I'm building with Sherby. So that's awesome. The the um, one common thing is that I I I do think, and it's like I, I've got back to it, and it's not just because therapy is based on relationships, is you know, the Harvard study, it's the longest active study it's like 100 years old is when boil it down and they track these people for years and years and years and years it all boiled down happiness to relationships mm -hmm. right to relationships no matter how much money you made how much success you had um at the end of the day it's relationships so um i i i know that part of that for me is is having a much more grounded relationship with myself in terms of understanding knowing my limitations, um, learning from my experience and drawing that out. And it's just a matter of how could I build a platform to help draw that on other people? So it just focus on, you know, my, my advice would just be, you know, it sounds weird. I do like the dancing, uh, the dancing class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cause this, yeah, like is, is take some time to get to know yourself. Yeah. Like, I mean, truly understand like, okay, it's here. Like, what do I like to do? I, I always sort of like, you know, sometimes people can't figure out what they want to do. Well, write a list of what you don't want to do. Start from there, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but yeah, I think it's just slow down, whether it's meditation, whether it's reading the book, whether it's just, you know, asking questions. And the number one thing, which is hard for me to say right now, because I seem like a hypocrite, because you guys have let me talk for... 63 minutes out of the 65 is listen. Become a really good listener because there's so much power behind it, you know, and that goes through studies, studies, studies to just listen, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and that's really it. I, you know, there's nothing, you know, groundbreaking in terms of advice. I just think, you know, the more, Opus and open and honest you, you can be with yourself. Um, it just sets the, the the groundwork to be open and honest with others, and from there it gets it gets pretty exciting and interesting, and it can get dark at times. But it's uh, it's been a lot better for me over the last handful of years to to admit, um, you know, those sort of things to others who have gone through similar experiences where we can grow and learn together. Well, that's great. Um, we really do appreciate you, you know, being so open and honest and vulnerable with us and, you know, sharing your story. And um, I think a lot of the things that you said are going to resonate with a lot of people and help a lot of people. So um, thank you so much um, for taking the time to talk with us and tell your story. We really do appreciate it. Flo, if you have anything else. I, I appreciate you coming on, like Danny said, telling your story, um, you know, for me and Danny, a lot of what you said is kind of what's been hitting home with us as of late. So um, I appreciate it personally. And I know a lot of people will benefit from what you said. Well, I appreciate it, guys. You guys are doing a great thing. And I, um, I, uh, I'll help in any way. And 
if you, I know you probably got a lot of good connections up there. If I can ever hop up in the Boston area, I always said I'm in a, I'm in a summer in Southie. Um, I love that <laughs> place. Uh, yeah, <laughs> good buddies up there. But let me know. And Danny, I know you're in the dirty church now, but um, yeah, whatever I can do to help you guys, you know, like I think our community is special, and you guys are doing a good thing. And um, whoever I can put you in touch with, because I think there's 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 a handful of good folks out there like yourselves that I think that there's like you guys know there's strength in numbers, right? You know, um, so yeah, I'm, I appreciate the opportunity. Hopefully, it made a little bit of sense for an old guy with a banged up head and, but with a lot of passion towards helping others. So, yeah, no, it definitely made a lot of sense to me, and I'm yeah. sure Flo. So, no, it was great. But all uh, right, thank you again. Really appreciate it. All right, thanks, guys. Enjoy the day.